Hey, hello, hello. How are you doing? So I am still waiting for the captain. You know, he was saying that maybe we can leave just tonight, but like tonight after midnight or something. So really looking forward to seeing you and meeting you and helping you if you can with, uh, with the video. video. See you. It seemed appropriate that in this land of the midnight sun, we should depart at midnight. A crew of four and 10 strangers from around the globe all seeking adventure or at least something meaningful. Yeah, because David was saying that we arrived here too late. After one day. <laughs> no, but because... <laughs> <laughs> it's midnight. The scientists quickly were at work, the lights of Reykjavik still twinkling behind us. For the next three hours, they took their measurements while the rest of us simply tried to find our sea legs. Expedition? I think so, yeah. Pretty, pretty. We had a bit of a rough start though. The first night was a little bit rough, yeah? We had a bit of everything, I think, yeah. Weather wise. Yeah. Um, yeah, mostly favorable winds, but a little bit too much of them in, in some cases. But uh, yeah, it's been, but it's been pretty nice, I would say. <laughs> Following the first day's storm, we took shelter in Olofsfjord. The captain warned of Iceland's increasingly erratic weather patterns. Something with unstable weather systems in recent years. More powerful waves, more, po more power in the swells. Um. As we waited out the gale, the team were keen to embark on their first beach cleanup. And now it's it's not exactly like that, it's different, but still. Yeah, yeah. You really see all this like, creativity, wow, just like people dress yeah. up the next. Yeah, we're going, <laughs> we're going clockwise. Okay, um, hello everyone, my name is Ari. Um, I'm from New York City in the, the US. Want to get out of my comfort zone a little bit of having been in the city now for like two years straight and just that urban lifestyle. So wanting to reconnect with nature to a degree. I really wanted to be part of an experience that uh, you're not just traveling through nature and seeing nature, you're actually really connecting with it and doing some stuff that actually has a purpose. Um, also from New York um, and about, I guess, maybe two weeks ago now, I quit my job of quite a while. Um, I've been in tech for basically my whole life, kind of just taking time to focus on the things I like to do, sailing, photography, uh, travel. I can't believe they let me do this. My name is Belen and I am from Spain. Dude, all my life I'm, I'm, I'm raised and um, well born in Husaik. That evening we continued our introductions and Hamir told us about Opal. The flagship of North Sailing, the fleet he started with his father and grandfather. But I noticed that uh, here, when there's no distinction between day and night, time becomes meaningless. Yeah, absolutely. 
It's so really everything is uh, everything is about the moment and the wind yeah. and the weather and the swell. Absolutely. And then in my experience, it it also gives you energy to to have 24 hours of daylight. And and uh, I just come from uh, a month up in the high Arctic. You know, the, now we're here at 66 north, but I was just. Uh, just came back from Svalbard where I'm 79 degrees so at this time of the year you have basically the sun circling in a s similar angle all day long and uh, that's just all one big long day. Yeah. Tell it in a letter, stamp and mail it out We did our best, couldn't have done better I think we should be proud But you held me down When I was living up Back and forth but never together So I'll stand up and walk out Sailing is at the heart of ocean missions. Some of us have had sailing experience, but none of us had sailed a traditional square rig tall ship. And we're all eager to learn. When I took the helm, Hedmir's advice was as elegant as it was simple. Let her do her dance upon the waves, she told me. Again, we sheltered from the weather. First thing I noticed when we docked was the fresh concrete wall, piles of aquaculture gear, and Norwegian fishing vessels. Icelandic unlocks and Arctic fish operate the fish farms here, which are majority owned by Norwegian companies. As I walked through the town, I was drawn to the Sea Monster Museum, where I later found Opal's crew. The museum manager told me that before Norwegian investment, the town was dying with fewer than 70 residents. Today, more than 300 people live here 
and it's growing. So we are preparing uh, the Manta Troll. Um, the Manta Troll is this device that we use to uh, study microplastic pollution in Icelandic waters. Uh, this is the first time somebody is um, looking at uh, microplastic pollution in ocean surface in Iceland. So it is very important to, to, to monitor our waters and get data on this, just to, to get the first uh, insights of how big is the problem. With Opal, we can, we normally sail to very remote areas, so these remote areas are often uh, difficult for science to reach, so then we use the opportunity to get this type of data. So in this case, we are now in one of the remote fjords uh, in the West Fjords. We are uh, surrounded by fish farms, which is um, one uh, growing industry here in Iceland, unfortunately, because fish farms are impacting our oceans in uh, different ways. But there's also like accumulation of microplastic going up the food chain. So it can actually be that the krills are getting it because they're eating tiny food, and then the whales are eating, you know, millions of krill, literally, and the, each krill has some plastic in it, so then it's like accumulation going, going up the food chain, which is a, a problem probably here. Um, so we are going to do three uh, trolls, in this location, 30 minutes each. So we're gonna turn to a course where the wind is not making us pick up speed, and then we're gonna start with our zigzag cross. We can start looking at it to see if we find something interesting. We can divide it in two. One can look at this one, one can look at here. And then we are trying to look for particles. So this is a nice point. You see the eyes and the tail? It's like, it's like a little bit green. So I mean, maybe it's on the other side. Can you move? Okay, it's gonna be a little bit. A ver, we have to turn it around. <laughs> it's so difficult. The microplastics measurements in the remote fjords of Anafortur revealed surprisingly low levels. However, it's a different story when we went ashore for a remote beach cleanup of macroplastics. Yeah, this is a very special place, as you can see. We've never been here before, which is um, very exciting for us as well. And um, we like to monitor uh, the beaches where we go often, like to, to see the status of the beaches, but we also like to, to explore new places. And we're going to start now our survey. Uh, we uh, gather also scientific data on, on marine debris in the beaches. So what we are going to do is to um, walk, all of us, make a line here behind this line. And we are going to walk together like that, finding uh, trash, okay? Everybody in position. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a race. <laughs> okay, let's go. We don't always do it so dramatically, but... <laughs> <laughs> Once the team have completed the scientists' 100-metre survey, 
but continued to clean the rest of the beach. And local landowner, Ari, came across the dunes to greet me as I hauled a pile of net along the sand. He was quick to vent his opposition to the fish farms. I introduced him to the rest of the team. Hello. Hi. Hi. From the feeding... Yeah. Okay, feeding for the fish farming. This is just from fishing. This is fish one, right? Yeah. This is This is from salmon farming. Yeah, this is the platform. And this is probably from the salmon farming. That must be a huge food. Yeah, you can see them if you go close to the. They used to mark the kind of kind of It's a cup. It's a kalp, yes. Kalp. Yeah, the first thing. Yeah. And that is also for the salmon? Or what is it? No. It's something of liberation? No, it's just it's kind of a mining. So they take the, the kalp. Is that where they're using the calcified seaweed mining? Yeah, this is the, what they call kalp. Uh, no, it's like the calcified seaweed that they're mining in the, in the sea. It's basically corals. Yeah. 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 They're mining. Yeah. Mining so seaweed. It's not seaweed, it's basically corals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. they used to the grind them and, and use them for the for the for the cup. I didn't yeah. know they could still do that here. Almost half a ton of debris we cleared from the beach, taken back to Opal to be later sorted and recycled. It was clear to me that a lot of these small towns and villages struggle to eke out a living, and fishing is the mainstay of their economies. I couldn't help but wonder how people survive here, so isolated in this wildly beautiful environment. Fair weather. And the most beautiful island in Iceland, according to Captain Hamur. We took the opportunity for a day trip to experience Drenga's abundant bird life. For hundreds of years, it was a source of food for mainlanders, yet it can only be scaled by rope or ladder. So many men have fallen to their deaths here that it was presumed that jealous trolls hiding in the cliff tops had cut their ropes. Our ascent was not quite so dramatic but it was still potentially dangerous and every bit as spectacular.
is that first I want to have lighter and darker zones. The tail. I think the tail is a little bit smaller. Yeah. It's like that. Is the chicken stuff in one? We want to fix because it has to. And all this is completely remote. The only play, the only way to arrive to this area is only by boat. Uh, so of course, uh, the plastic and everything else could be also coming from very, very far away, right? So we go around the horn and then we continue looking at the cliffs and we'll keep our journey through. Honshundi is the most isolated and remote region of Iceland, a vast nature reserve on the edge of the inhabitable world. The plan was to anchor in a fjord of Hornvik and clean a beach where debris can come from as far as Siberia. But it was clear the weather would not permit this. Pamir decided it was too risky to stop. And we kept sailing for what would become a 28 hour continuous leg. We rounded the horn into the Greenland Sea and saw the gathering wind. I couldn't help but feel as though the sea must have been transformed into charging Valkyrie, intent on driving us out. The stroke of midnight. Pamir hoists sail and reefs the main ahead of the storm. We would not outrun it. For the next five hours, the gale raged and battered over the steep, hard waves. Most of us went down below and tried to sleep. Sleep was impossible. Twice we were thrown from our bunkers. Buffeted and tossed, creaking tensions and slapping water, it was all we could do was just to hold on. Especially after a storm. After the storm? Yeah. It's broke during the storm. We had really like like I would say one of the the most beautiful highlights I ever had in, in, in OM, in Northern Missions. We were 
in this spectacular landscape in the West Fields, right, with the sunset and the power of the wind, and we were all so happy, and we were all very emotional. And suddenly I was just feeling so high and happy, fulfilled, and like, I don't know, that feeling of this is life, no, this is, this is love and life. And then a few hours later, everything turned around. Pretty, um, pretty bad uh, waves and, and rolls and... Uh... Uh, in that big storm, uh, somehow the, our manta troll was gone. And probably the manta was tied up on the deck and probably it, uh, when a wave came over the boat, it probably floated up over the, uh, over the side of the boat and so, yeah, that was very unfortunate. It was uh, um, uh, quite a symbolic little tool that we built just at the very beginning of ocean missions. And, uh, Probably the most important uh, thing we had, like... But maybe, maybe sometime we might pick it up on the beach. Yeah, possibly, because it's, uh, it's floating. So if it, if it uh, survived the, the hit, you know, then possibly we'll see it one day in a beach clear. I am writing what um, each people in this boat has um, give to me because I think that all of you has um, been giving something very important and um, I have been feeling very alive and it's because of, of course, experience, the journey, but also <laughs> all of you. I've never been on the boat. I've never been uh, really, uh, yeah, I've never been on the boat. So it was full of uh, <laughs> a lot of waves and a lot of sickness, but <laughs> it was an adventure. <laughs> this trip will change a bit uh, me. <laughs> And, um, the trip will change you. Yeah, I yeah. think. How do you think it will change you? I don't know. The way to see the life. <laughs> I didn't think so at first that it would have like this um, impact on me. But being out there um, between all the waves and, and watching the wildlife um, it was just so beautiful, even, mm. even though the weather wasn't, wasn't really nice, uh, I just loved it. And to be honest, I really didn't want to wanna go back on land. <laughs> With my photography, I uh, often, very often, um, stay at a location for a long period of time. So I experience um, also how much time other people spend in a location, and there's Sometimes just people coming, like stepping out of the car, taking a few images and not even five minutes later they're back in their car, just leaving again. So I don't really think that in that way you can actually um, experience or connect to nature. I don't really think you, you get what it's about if you don't take your time. Now 
it's gone Our love was beautiful